Hello, salutations, greetings, welcome to the Drep and Stone podcast, the podcast where two friends raise a glass and have a conversation. I'm Nick. I'm Kyle. What do you think about that? That was really good. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. Just, you know, every once in a while throwing, yeah, throwing was, some things at the people. It was fresh. Yeah. Yeah. Liked, yeah. Liked yeah speaking it. of fresh. Whoa. Yeah. You see my feet right now? Yeah. It's the summer. Yeah, it is. I think it's a time to let the tootsies out. Oh, man. Yeah. Which brings me to a question. What's that? Sandals. Okay. We live in the state of Florida. Mm-hmm. And flip-flops, sandals, thong sandals, whatever you want to call them, they, they are basically dress shoes all the time. You can wear them wherever you want. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Acceptable everywhere. Exactly. To to a, a court date, flip-flops. Yep. Yeah. To a wedding, flip-flops. Sure. Uh, to a funeral, flip-flops. Yeah. To a fine dining restaurant, flip-flops. A- anywhere. Yeah, that's my thought process. Okay, are you a flip flop guy? Are you a uh, uh, velcroy sandal guy? Are you a water shoe guy? What what is your what is your preferred summer footwear? Whoa, preferred in, in that realm? In that realm? <laughs> okay, in, in that realm, it's a thong. Ooh, yeah, yeah. In in, in the sandal flip flop genre, it's <laughs> it's going to be a thong. Very simple. Yeah, not not a lot of doodads. <laughs> Uh, I've tried leather. That's a bad call. <laughs> Don't do it. Uh, just like, you know, some sort of like, you know, uh, yoga mat material oh, yeah. with like just some very basic woven yeah. thongs over the top. <laughs> that's all you need. Yeah. That's the preference. Me too, except like I, I go with the I go with the leather. But I, I don't wear those into the water, like never, because that's that's a bad that's a bad thing. Like I've I've got some semi hairy feet, you know, kind of <laughs> hobbitish. Yeah, and I've got I've got a tuft of hair right at the top that the leather would grab. And, oh, and pull. oh, oh! Didn't like that's didn't no care bueno. for. It. Yeah, yeah. No, you don't it. want that. Mm-mm. Went away from that real quick. <laughs> <laughs> you get one experience you're like and done and nope not, not doing that anymore yeah I, mm. okay i get that yeah so yeah no it's just straight thongs for me now <laughs> as little resistance as possible i understand yeah yeah uh i and i feel likewise yep okay i just i just wanted to you know. ever you ever do the tiva you ever do the 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 birkenstock no look I, back in the I, day like i i I think i did it once or twice and it was because my dad did it and i was like he, he was in at one point into kayaking and yeah. that was like a thing <laughs> Right. It was like the officially yeah. sponsored like footwear you need of the kayaking. Keen, like the ugly keen sandal. Yeah. And like just those things are just brutally ugly. Yeah. Um, but I, I would li- I wouldn't mind a good pair of Birkenstock. Mm. Uh, like I know my sister loves Birkenstocks and I know a bunch of people like swear by them. Right. And I just for whatever reason I, I it's too much shoe for me. I want yeah. less shoe. Yeah, for sure. Like I, I definitely tried it back in the day and didn't really care for it. Yeah. Uh, I remember the the very classic. There was, the, for a time period there, it was, it was like knee high white socks <laughs> with Nike black <laughs> slip ons. Yeah, yeah. Uh, attempted that also. Yeah. Luckily, that didn't last long. Cause you're not playing soccer. You don't play <laughs> soccer and slip on flip flops anyway. Like, I know. It was. It was. It was the the athletic thing. It was like the athletic look. Yeah, I remember. But like, yeah, immediately I, reverted back to thongs after. Yeah, that. for and sure. That's just, I, that's just at one I've point, been. like I was, uh, I was going with like the cheap thongs too, uh, like the old navy thongs. We were like sure. buck twenty five, and that's a, that's a bad call. Yeah, you gotta you gotta put a little bit of care you into do. it, you some do. thought, and yeah. and get you a good pair because you don't want to blow out while you're on like a roller coaster or like at a oh, theme man. park. You're screwed. I had a pair of thong tevas one time. Yeah, that were my favorite pair of flip flops ever. And I was in Cancun, not Cancun. I was in Cozumel, yeah. and we went to Seven Mile Beach, and they were doing some like construction in like the parking lot area. And the taxi that we you know rented to take us over there just dropped us off out there at the street, and we had to walk all the way in. Yeah, and we're walking through this like areas where they were clearly like laying some sidewalk and stuff like that. <sighs> and I missed a spot. Oh no! I wasn't paying attention and stepped right in this like half mud, half concrete mixture. No. And you piss off a lot of people that day. Well, no, it was like excess. It oh. was not. It was oh. not like a like a like a clean sidewalk or anything. It was just like a puddle off to the side that I wasn't paying attention to and stepped in. Yeah, and immediately like, yeah, yeah. The the the, the flip flop was stuck. I tried to step out of it, broke the sandal. Oh man, I was so sad, so bummed out. And I, I I took them down to the went ahead and wore them all the way down to the water and like. I mean, it turned into concrete like immediately. Wow. Like I couldn't get it off of it. I was, 
I was bummed out. Yeah, that's the worst. Favorite pair I ever had. Still remember that. Still brings a tear to my eye. I, I've got a cure for that tear. What's that? Cocktail. Let's do it. Yeah, you ready for another one? Yeah. All right, we're going to go make this cocktail. Okay. It is a, a peach-based cocktail. Ooh. I know, a little bit of... Um, Little peach, little grapefruit. Grapefruit. I know. Think about that. Yeah, a little peach. little bitter note. Yeah, peach, some grapefruit, a little uh, bourbon. If I was you will. gonna say it sounds like a bourbon. Little, a little bit of whiskey, if you will. Oh man. I know. You ready? Yeah. All right. Let's go make one, and then uh, we'll see everybody on the other side. All right. Let's do it. All right, Kyle, we've got our drink. Yeah. We never said what it was. No, not fully. Uh, we're going to call this From Peachy with Love. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. A little, yeah. little James Bond on you. Yeah, uh, and this is basically a, a grapefruit-based drink that is made with Crown Royal Peach, uh, specifically, I think. like I guess if you had another peach whiskey you could definitely do that why right. not uh, but we use crown royal peach uh it's got a little bit of lime juice in there a dash of sea salt uh specs real quick ready hit him. three ounces of grapefruit uh 1.5 ounces of, of peach whiskey a quarter of an ounce of simple syrup and a half ounce of lime juice and then a dash of sea salt throw that all into a shaker shake it up pour it over fresh ice garnish with a rosemary sprig. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we got. Interesting. I know. Rosemary. Like yeah. Very, very holiday. I, th I thought it was a little holiday, but I thought it would do nice to kind of bring out some of the, the notes of the peach. All right. Shall we? On the yeah. nose? I, I got a lot of rosemary. <laughs> well, that's because you stuck the rosemary up your nose. I, I get some like subtle hints of peach, um, but a lot of grapefruit. And just a, a dash of rosemary on there. Yeah. If I search for it, I can find the grapefruit yeah. and then rosemary. Yeah. Well, the rosemary, in this case, just acts as the the first scent, if you will. Like, there's no rosemary in this. Right. You could, make a, you could very easily make a rosemary simple syrup, if you like, right. and do that. But I didn't want, like, that much rosemary. I just wanted, like, a whiff. For sure. Yeah. All right. Shall we? Okay. It's all there. Yeah. I'm, get, I'm getting all of it. You don't hear me say this often? I think it could be a touch sweeter. Yeah. I mean, it, it's... It's right there. I feel like it's really close. Like it, it's not like I, I'm, I'm not a a big grapefruit fan. Yeah, because it is so bitter. But I feel like there, there's a, there's there's enough of a peach pop that starts to come through to balance it. Like yeah. I, I wouldn't disagree. Like I don't know if it would be a half ounce more of whiskey or would it just be more of like a maybe an extra quarter ounce of simple, simple. might would balance it just just right. But yeah. I don't. I don't know. No, I, I really, I actually enjoy it, but I know how bitter that um, grapefruit is. To me, I almost want the the peach to sing just a little bit more. Maybe a little little peach puree. Yeah, oh, yeah. Or maybe a peach simple syrup. Or, yep. I mean, because I, I never made this before. We just threw it together. I've, I've tried a few cocktail recipes where, where it, it called for a puree yeah. of a thing. And I was like, well, I've got the juice. I'll just do the juice. Yeah, that's not the same. Yeah, it's, it, and, it, and it doesn't. Doesn't quite get there. It's not strong enough. The juice itself isn't potent enough to really throw the flavor in there. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of a Paloma. Yeah, agreed. Obviously, you've you've taken out the tequila. You said the tequila for peach whiskey, and uh, but you still have like there's a bit of salt in there, so you still have the Paloma almost yeah. like background. Yep, agreed. And it's just shifting it just a little bit. Actually, I I quite like that. I do too. You know what I'm gonna do? A little floater. I think I'm gonna do a little floater. We got we got a little bit. You want, little, you want a little float? Oh, okay, yeah, float me. Yeah, I think that'll definitely give you the the peach pop on the nose for sure. Yeah, I think you just just float just a bit on the top. <laughs> when you brought up peach earlier, I was like, oh shit, he's gonna make something with benchmark. <laughs> 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 he's trying to find a benchmark cocktail. He can get rid of some <laughs> of those bottles. <laughs> oh yeah, it's peach all over the nose now. Oh yeah, and that goes so well. Oh wow, with the rosemary. It really does. That's oh, that's shit. just enough. Yeah, that, that's it right there. Ooh, that's fantastic. Oh, Damn. wow. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's all right. I could even, you know what? I might even take a, if I wanted to go fancy garnish, I would grill me a peach. <laughs> yeah. I, I'd spear that peach with this rosemary, throw that on the grill, yep. fire that thing up, put it on there. Or, you know what? I just, I got a kitchen torch. Give it a little sizzle. Yeah. Man, that's pretty good. Yeah, I like I, that. I, that's actually that's really refreshing. <laughs> that is really refreshing. Yeah. Wow. I want to try something that I know that 
neither one of us have had. Yeah. That's really well balanced. Yeah. I think balance, and we talked about this, I think balance is the key here. Yeah. Like th- this one for me, it's, it's, it's so, it, it is loud with its flavors, but it's balanced in terms of like, you know, sweet, bitter. Yeah. Yeah. But that little savory note with the, with the salt actually kind of comes through. Yeah, it does. I think this is like, this is perfect. Like pre-dinner, you know? Yeah. Little amuse bouge. Yeah. Maybe sipping on it with your with your salad. Ooh, shit! And you probably yeah. you're probably gonna have like a summer you know strawberry or peach salad. Yeah, Whoa. with some with some pecans. Oh yeah, a little <laughs> vinaigrette action. Chot dang, yeah. You say chot dang? Hot dang. <laughs> you said chot dang. I, I said sh- hot dang. Chot dang. Hot dang. I impressed myself. That rosemary is so interesting though. <laughs> Every time I go, because like the way I'm trying to drink at it is uh, well, I've got the rosemary at the back. Big ass rosemary. Spring. I know it like tickles my forehead when I drink. <laughs> I didn't know that. And it goes right in my nose, <laughs> and it's like it's like it's like Christmas in my nose, but then like very summery delightfulness on my on my palate, and it's just like a, a, a complete like woo. All these things are happening. Confusion. Yeah. yeah. I kind of that's mm. all right. That's a tasty cocktail. Agreed. Well done, sir. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so we got a very delightful cocktail. Thank you. What should we talk about? I read a book lately by the Japanese author um, Haruki Murakami. You can read Japanese? I can, yeah. Actually, I'm, I'm pretty proficient at reading Japanese. Uh, this this one just happens to also be translated into English. Uh, um, but, I, I yeah, I'm, I'm fluent in uh, in Japanese. Very cool. Yeah, uh, kon- konnichiwa. Origato. Thanks. Uh, I think do, that's what do it means. Yeah, no, thank you. Is 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 our arigato? Oh, our, what is? Huh? Thank you. Is arigato? Right. Yeah. Domo arigato. What's domo? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm not fluent in in 80s rock. <laughs> I'm just letting you know. Just Japanese. <laughs> and it is not Japanese, sir. Domo anyway, arigato. Uh, I I really like um, Haruki Murakami as as an author. But he published this book uh, sort of recently, or it came out in 2022 okay. in English, but it was originally written in Japanese in 2015. So okay. I, just, I just happened to read the English version. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, anyway, it's called Novelist as a Vocation, and it's Haruki Murakami kind of talking about his whole perspective of being a, a novelist and a, a fiction writer as a whole. Okay. There's a chapter in this book called On Originality. Okay. In which he's wrestling with what it means to be an author, what it means to to write stories. And there's a, a section that I thought was just super interesting. Okay. Uh, a, a little bit of setting up here before I get to the kind of the meat of what I, I want to discuss. He says, it's relatively easy to take examples of originality from the past and analyze them from today's perspective. Almost always, the things that should have disappeared for lack of originality have already done so, leaving us to confidently evaluate what remains yeah you with me yeah okay so like the Beatles would seem I'm, I'm skipping a little bit here but the Beatles would seem to occupy a special category since they were popular from the outset as countless instances show however it is far more difficult to properly assess in real time new forms of expression in our immediate environment that's because they often contain elements seen as unpleasant unnatural nonsensical or sometimes even antisocial or else just plain stupid Whatever the case, those around us tend to react with surprise and at the same time shock. People instinctively dislike those things they can't understand, a pattern characteristic of members of the establishment who are buried up to their ears in the dominant forms of expression. They tend to apprehend the newcomer with abhorrence and disgust because, in a worst-case scenario, the very ground upon which they stand might fall away from under them. Meaning like when we think of these things that are original, these things that are examples of originality, we tend to view them as tent poles because all the other things that sucked at that time have all kind of dissipated. Right. So like there are tons of bands that came out at the same time that the Beatles did. Right. But most people We don't that, remember them. Yeah, you only really remember the Beatles. Right. So he comes up with these three criterion for things to be deemed original in his perspective. Okay. And I'm interested in your thoughts on this. When, when you say originality, for something to be original, a, as a as a person who went through college and art school, yep. I kind of developed the firm belief that, at least within art, and from what I can kind of tell of basically pretty much any other 
profession, there is no real originality. Yeah. Everything kind of builds on things that came before it. And it's just kind of finding a new avenue, a new, a new connection, a new concoction of elements that are put together in a certain way that make it new and right. fresh and original, if you want to call it that. Not, not a completely brand new aesthetic that was not previously Correct. thought of, but it was, it was it's more of a slow culmination. Okay. This is part of what he's discussing here. Okay. Like, what is this version of originality? So the chapter starts with that question. What is originality? Okay. That's a hard question to answer. Yeah, So yeah, it says Murakami. For sure. Right. Uh, he says, when we say a work of art is original, what exactly do we mean? What are its qualifications? These kinds of questions only make us more and more confused when we try to answer them head on. What is what you just said? What is originality? How do we begin to define originality? He says, perhaps the concept of originality can be understood more easily if we set direct definitions and rational theories aside and look instead at concrete examples. He gives uh, the Beatles as examples. He gives Igor Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring as an example um, in which like, I don't know if you know anything about The Rite of Spring, but like when Igor Stravinsky first debuted The Rite of Spring in Paris in 1913, I, I encourage if you haven't listened to The Rite of Spring or our listeners haven't, like pause for a second and just listen to the first two minutes of the um i think it's a ballet called the rite of spring it is jarring i believe the rite of spring is in fantasia 2000 it is yeah it is as the the uh-huh. nature it is and so like he he goes on to say like when that first debuted people could not handle it like they literally like freaked out and left the concert hall in paris like it just it was so much for them today like we listen to it and we're like yeah, that's weird, but it's not earth shattering to us because it's not the same thing. Like we've we've kind of experienced so many different things. I've I know I've heard that about like other things that people couldn't handle it or that that moment was so jarring that it like it disrupted the audience or whatever. And it's like back then I remember hearing those things and being like, Oh, that's stupid. But in that context of like you don't hear music all the time. Right. So to be abruptly kind of assaulted that way by the music absolutely would be like that or it'd be like you'd never get to see movies at all here's a quentin tarantino movie just out of the blue whoa yeah i can't handle this imagine sitting in a dark theater in 1977 and you hear and you see the scroll the scroll oh, for yeah. star wars that was a terrible imitation yeah, was like, of star wars <laughs> what what is that but like yeah imagine like oh my god what and you yeah. see this like thing scrolling into the background yeah like whoa yeah. okay so back to your question what is originality how do we define originality okay I, i'm gonna say like one of the most widely known and well-known japanese authors that this is haruki murakami okay uh his works have been translated into many different languages can can you give me in your understanding uh-huh. what 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 is original to you this this is why i'm bringing this up because i i don't know I'm I'm wrestling with this version of originality. How do I define originality? Well, and, and just simply because too, it's like it's something that's original to you, and sure. sometimes that can be hard to differentiate because I don't maybe I don't know the history of the thing, or yeah, I don't I don't know where you're pulling your influences from, so it's hard. But like, it seems original to me, right? If I were to put like a loose thing on it, it is something that's just like. I haven't experienced it, and in in the wealth of knowledge that I have on that topic, this stands out as something different. Yeah, that I can't necessarily put a specific reference on it. Of like, so, you clearly got that here. I think I think the the version of originality, like I'm still trying to figure out for me, like what do I view as something that is an original, but it, it comes also from experience of a wide variety within that uh, genre or within that art form. Like if I were to look at a Monet. And I see a Monet and I'm like, whoa, I've never seen a painting like this. Then that is my only frame of reference for an original or that being an originality or that being original. For you. For me, right. Right. But then when I start to wander through this art museum or I start to, to view a bunch of different uh, contemporary Monet, contemporary artists, and I start to see 
all he's doing is blending the art styles that came before him into his version and then his contemporaries back and forth and there's like this larger commentary, then I can start to actually ascertain whether or not Monet is an original. Is this thing something that is that is brand new? Unique. Right. And never before done. So I think to your question, to me, originality absolutely begins with the individual. And then as the individual begins to experience more and understand more about that particular artwork or that particular type of art, then that version of originality morphs. An example would be something like Elvis. I'm not saying that Elvis was the first person to do this necessarily, but something like combining soul, combining country, um, and then morphing and reworking that into his own style and, and you know, taking things from uh, African-American culture, taking things from like almost like flamenco guitar culture, taking things from country and then blending that, then he becomes an original. So like, is he doing things that no one's ever done? No, but he's doing that in a very specific way. I, I want to answer your question by giving you Murakami's criterion. Okay. I don't think it's the answer, but I think it is an interesting answer. Okay. So he says, in my opinion, an artist must fulfill the following three basic requirements to be deemed original. So I want to give them all three to you, and then I want to maybe discuss each one. Okay. Okay. So, number one, he says, the artist must possess a clearly unique and individual style of sound, language, or color. Moreover, that uniqueness should be immediately perceivable upon first sight or hearing. Number two, that style must have the power to update itself. It should grow with time, never resting in the same place for long, since it expresses an internal and spontaneous process of self-reinvention. Number three, over time, that characteristic style should become integrated within the psyche of its audience to become a part of their basic standard of evaluation. Subsequent generations of artists should see that style as a rich resource from which they can draw. That, to Murakami, makes something and original agreed like couldn't couldn't agree more you know in in responding to what murakami said and responding to your question initially people tend to dislike originality because it's something that's jarring and and i think like a contemporary example would be billy eilish think about billy eilish you know her first breakout song and think about that style whether you like Billie Eilish or not, that like um, still pop, but like synthy and also quiet and not full singing, uh, but like whispering and very low and quiet lyrics, but also super introspective. Like when I first heard that, I was like, what is this crap? Like, no way. This is not what is she? I don't know a lot of Billie Eilish. That's like, okay. I, I know. That's I know. Okay. Bad guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bad guy. Is that it? Yeah, like it's it's that kind of thing. Yeah, it's, it's the song "Bad Guy" and then like stuff from that first album. Again, I'm not a big fan of Billie Eilish even now, but I can see that she was on the cusp of that, mm-hmm. doing something that is new, and either people gravitated towards it because they're like, oh, "This is new," or their response is, "No, that's weird. I don't like that." And then given the chance, and as this new style has kind of developed there are so many artists right now that are doing the same thing right as she's now evolving in that and past at the same time right yeah like music for me is a hard one to like pinpoint originality yeah just because like i feel like you know my my sense of sound is not as in tuned okay so like it's it's difficult for me to like say like Oh yeah, no, I, that that's completely different, and I don't hear that uniqueness anywhere else. And I think too, just because like every musician or artist would would easily be able to tell you, oh yeah, no, here here's my here's the people that I'm looking at. These are my influences, and then with the proper knowledge, you would be able to look and say, oh yeah, sure. clearly, like I, 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 I can see that. 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 Yeah. I can see where you're getting. What what you did here, you got here from this person and that sort of a thing. There's a really good example of that, what you just said with Nirvana's um, a teen smells like teen spirit. Mm. And like that is such a an iconic song now. Uh, but when it came out, like people 
uh, I you know had that response of like whoa or like nah. But Dave Grohl, who's the drummer now, even now says like I totally ripped off all of the drums for that entire album from Disco, mm. and he like says a disco band. I forget which band he's talking about. He's like, uh, you know, the, the beginning of smells like teen spirit. He's like, that is this song. And he like plays it just kind of like, you know, drumming the rhythm. It's like, Oh yeah. Like I, I've seen some really interesting things recently about, um, they were showing how daft punk would take a short little clip from this song over here, alter the, the speed of it and the pitch. Yeah. The pitch yeah. and things. And, and they would turn that into this little quick little thing here. And then they would utilize this other piece from this other song, different artists, and then use that in this rhythm section here. Right. And how they would assimilate, is that the right word? How they would then create this whole other arrangement right. to yeah. make their songs. And it's like, wow, that's interesting and unique. It, it's something completely different. But like yeah. now that I've seen where and how you, you grab those clips, it's like very interesting like you're taking these bits and pieces to create this whole new thing that's not even like remotely similar from the thing that you got it from but that's and interesting I, I think to Murakami's definition here he's not saying that these things have never been done before what he is saying is that these things are unique yeah and I recognize how like it's easy to like uniqueness and never been done before but it's not like you know, Daft Punk or or any artist, they're still painting with the same materials, right. roughly. Right. They're still using the same kind of you know mediums, but it's I've arranged this in a unique way. I've taken this clip, as you just mentioned, I've sped it up and I've changed the pitch, and now it's making something unique. Right. So it's not this idea of like this person is doing something that's never been done before. We like to say that as like a, a kind of a, a banal platitude of like, yeah, this artist doing something never been done before, which is untrue. I mean, you think about any any narrative being told really boils down to two different stories. Right. Hero takes a journey, stranger comes to town. Right. Like those are the stories. So like every story has been done before. Right. If you look at it from that perspective, nothing is unique. I think that's a very kind of cynical way of looking at it. But then how does an individual rearrange this perspective to create something that then becomes their own? Right. Let's go Caravaggio. People have been painting with dark colors and light colors for centuries. Right. And yet what he does is he takes and strips away and adds and presents this. And now you have, Images that look like they are literally leaping off of the canvas and that then becomes unique. And yet there are contemporaries of his that are doing something very similar. Right. They catch on to it and then add their bit to it. I've been having this conversation in my head recently. I think it kind of stemmed from the, the essay about Tarantino. Yeah. Tarantino, I feel like, is quite original in his take in his movies and how he does it and how much he, he, he pays attention to his, his, his portfolio. Oh yeah. Legacy. Kind of, yeah, yeah. yeah. Of how, how specific it feels like it needs to be, how they're all connected and you don't get to throw away anything. It's all, it all counts, which seems quite original in its, in, in its context now. But I remember thinking about that and something to me that kind of seems to stand out about originality is if you're able to do something that is original, that is perceived to be original, and you do it so well mm-hmm. that other artists are afraid to try to replicate it. Right. And I, I mean, <laughs> I've got an example of that. Okay. That is not, it's not foolproof. There have certainly been other people who've tried to do it, but I don't feel like they've ever gotten it anywhere near his success. Is Tim Burton. Oh, yeah. Like, Tim Burton's style is so unique and different different yeah it feels very original certainly like a perfect example you can look at things like you can see things where he got inspiration from like Hieronymus Bosch sure stuff like that like you can see where he's pulling inspirations from but then to do it in such a different style that is very unique and very much him to the point that like you can look at any movie that he's ever done and say instantly Tim Burton instantly. And and that's, that's like the third part of Murakami's thing here is like, you can instantly recognize that work as that person's work. Like, I think that's like such a interesting thing about that kind of originality to where it's like, 
Like, name somebody that's ever tried to replicate Tim Burton. Right. Like, certainly there are people who have tried to kind of grab that style yeah. that he created, but, like, never in his medium, I don't really feel like. No, because they've all been like, no, that's Tim Burton. It's like it's like they get up to they get up next they, to well, it. I think they like, don't want to be compared. Kinda, yeah, yeah, I think there's like, the fear of like I can't do it as well as he does it. Yeah, or like, like I don't want to be Tim Burton. Yeah, you know, that kind of thing. But it's you know I mean you think about like all the great artists that have ever existed. It's like yeah, no, it's like oh he he's he's getting success doing that. I'm gonna do that. Right. And it's like with with him specifically, I, I've just had this because of the new Beetlejuice trailer. <laughs> So it's been on my it's been on my mind, but like it's so specific to him, right? That you don't ever confuse it with like, well, is that him or is that that other guy? Right. It's just that's Tim Burton. That's a really good. And point. like, I feel like that's like quintessential originality where you get that specific with it. Yeah. Like I mean, you you can think of like some other things. Like there's been some other like stop motion movies that get up next to it like i think of like Coraline. there's like there's one that was like about a house or oh monster house that one yeah there's the one paranorman about the paranorman yeah there's that this. like they get they get close to it right. but it's never full-on tim burton right you know it's never the stripes and the patterns and like going all the way Obtuse there two angles and yeah, yeah it's yeah. always like we get close to it we right. want it we want to like but also at the same time, we don't want you to just say, oh, yeah, you're just trying to copy Tim Burton. Right. So, like, I feel like if you ever are able to accomplish that kind of originality, like, yeah, it's, you it's did almost the like thing, man. It, it almost becomes you become the person that people like don't want to be compared to. Like, ah, uh, you don't want to be Tim Burton. Right. But yeah. You're, like, well, you're, you're just trying to be Tim Burton. Right. But he's already doing it. Whereas, like, you think about like every 90s band. Every 90s band essentially sounds the same because you all have, and this goes for music. I know I keep going back to music, but like all of these generation generations of musicians, until like you get one that is like doing something different, they all sound the same. They all replicate the same sound, you right? Know? Uh, and and to be fair, with artists too, you know, you, you've got the, there are schools of art for a reason, right? But yeah, I mean, it's it's taking something that's that's different and unique, which certainly I think we could say like Tim Burton does and to a point that it it, it gets enough popularity and yeah. claim that pretty much anybody can look at the thing and say yeah that's tim burton, tim burton. Mm-hmm. and the fact that like no other contemporary guys want to get close to it because it's too obviously or you're copying his right. style or even like, to be confused as that thing yeah you know okay so like uh, another just quick example would be like bob ross and thomas kincaid like if you look at a Bob Ross painting and a Thomas Kincaid painting, there are a lot of similarities between the two, but there are dramatic differences between the two. Obviously, Bob Ross is more nature. Thomas Kincaid is more, you know, houses and light. <laughs> right. But like there's a lot of comparison between the two. But I know you, you could very easily go paint a Bob Ross portrait or a Bob Ross painting very easily. But as soon as you present that to someone, what are they going to say? Oh, this, you're just copying Bob. Ross. Yeah, this is not a this this is not a Drep original. This is a Bob Ross knockoff. Even right. if you're taking a landscape that Bob Ross never painted, or it's very similar, you, you're recreating the uh, the Home Alone house. Which every time I look at a Thomas Kincaid painting, that's what I feel <laughs> like. But you're you're recreating the Home Alone house, right. and you paint it in in like any version of style of Thomas Kincaid. They're not going to say, "Man, this is a Drep original." They're going to say, "Oh, he's painting like Thomas Kincaid." Right. And and to that idea, to me, that then is a hallmark of the originality, where someone can look at someone's original painting, yours, and then say, uh, but you're just copying that person. So the Thomas Kincaid is the original. You right. You see what I mean? Yeah. Totally. Even though knowing that he wasn't the first person to do that exact thing, he's cobbling other ideas together, and boom. Right. There it is. It's It's reaching that echelon of... You can look at that thing and immediately give attribution. Exactly. And not just because of some unique Oh, that gets tough. Like that that's where I get that's where I get hung up with like music specifically. It's like, yes, like your voice sure. is unique and different. Is it original? I mean it's just it's it's a voice, but because I can hear that, I know that's the thing. Right. But that doesn't, I don't feel like that makes it unique and original. Right. Identification of the thing does not 
secure originality. To some degree, I think it's when the other things that are being created are then compared to that thing rather than, yeah, no, I think I think that's what it is. Like your your work, even though it is an original piece of work, is now compared to that thing. Right. On that note, you got anything else? Nope. No, me neither. I've got nothing in my glass. Oh shit! I still got like half a cocktail over. Here. Well, I was, I was drinking and talking. Yeah, I was, I was pontificating. I guess yes. <laughs> a little too <laughs> ferocious. Well, I knew what I wanted to say. <laughs> I, I went into this going like, I got points. Here it is, done. Yeah. Well, and I, I basically, you know, I also read from a book. <laughs> so, <laughs> in some cases, right. Well, we'd love to know what do you think about this version of originality? What is what is something that is original, or how do you define originality? Yeah. Yeah, good question. Yeah, think of something in some other medium that we're clearly not thinking about. Just like, wh- where did you see originality and it, it blew you away? Oh, perfect question. We also want to know, what do you think about the From Peachy with Love? Is, is Did you make that name up? I did, on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> I did, yeah, on the spot. From Peachy with Love. From Peachy with Love, yeah. Yeah, because it, it is, you know, a very delightful cocktail. You definitely should try it and let us know what you think about well, it. Well, and I think, I'm going to say this, I think this is a perfect use for flavored whiskeys. Things like this. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, because like, yeah. I mean, you can drink it straight, and it's not terrible, but right. it's things like this where the flavored whiskey really shines. Yeah, allowing to use its originality. <laughs> To enhance the cocktail. Correct. Yeah. You can get in touch with us through email. That's drepandstone at gmail.com. You can also get in touch with us through social media. It's always one word, Drep and Stone. Come find us wherever you're socializing your medias because we're making our media socialized there also, and you can uh, interact with it. I couldn't say it better myself. Yeah. And we'd also love it if you support the podcast. You can do so through several ways, the first of which is to visit flaviar.com for your alcohol beverage needs and you can use the promo code dsp10 that helps save you a little bit of money and helps the podcast out yeah two wins yeah right you in a row can, you can also support the podcast by rating drop and stone wherever it is you find great podcasts like this one you can support the podcast by finding us on patreon supporting us there that's patreon.com slash drop and stone and finally kyle sir you can support the podcast by by telling someone about Drep and Stone. It's an easy process. You just let somebody know. You're in the movie theater because it's the summer and you're watching a movie. Yeah. And it's the uh, the pre-pre-credits. Like you got there early. You wanted that good, good seat because you're in a theater that doesn't let you see. Oh, like an seats. old school. Yeah, yeah, Old yeah. school theater. And you're there a good 30 minutes before the film. Right. And uh, you're not watching like real previews. It's just like ads. It's one of those awkward situations where you're in there, you've got your seat set, and you're the only person in there. But then the next person that comes in sits right beside you. That's happened to me before. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you just you turn to that person and you say, hello, good sir and or madam. <laughs> you just look at them and say, drep and stone. And when they look back at you and they, and say, they say, excuse me, what? And you say, you sat here, drep and stone. What's that? Get your phone, drep and stone. You're scaring me. What is it? You sat next to me, drep and stone. What do you not understand? D-R-E-P and stone. Look it up right now. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, it's a podcast. Yeah, it's a podcast. Could actually, you could have just said it was a podcast. Well, you came and sat next to me. This is a theater that is completely devoid of other people. I understand that, but I mean, I'm just trying to get the good seat like you did. You, you got the best seat. I'm just trying to get the second best seat. And I'm okay with that, but I just want you to look up this podcast that I'm really a fan of. You didn't tell me it was a podcast. You just you just yelled at me, dra- drip and stuff. Well, now you know it's a podcast, and um, I also snuck in this little flask of whiskey. Would you like some? <laughs> yeah. I, I need to make it up. You're right. Like I was yeah. out of line. I'm so sorry. You are correct. It was awkward. You made it awkward first. Is that peach crown oil? (laughs) You made it awkward first. I'm just going to, you know, I I was just throwing it back at you. But now that we're friends, would you like some of this whiskey? Yes, yes. I will try some of your crown oil peach. (laughs) Good. Salted caramel. Do me one more favor, though. What's that? Uh, When we leave this film, Drep and Stone may or may not have covered it. Who knows? And just listen to a couple episodes. And uh, here's my number. Let me know what you think. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Uh, I am not holding your hand through this movie, though. I just want you to know that, too. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> it's that easy. Yeah, that's super simple. I, I mean, <laughs> it seems relatively complicated, but I promise it's not. I think in reality, it probably plays out very similar to that. I'm actually worried if it does. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. May your glass overflow. And your ass never show. Cheers, buddy. Cheers. Cheers.